you have a Bible, I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3 is where we're going to be spending our time here this morning. Also, there are notes in your bulletin that you can use to follow along uh, here as the, as the service goes forward today. I encourage you to do that. Um, when we see the results that you saw on the screen, I don't know about you, but uh, I don't take that for granted because that's pretty amazing stuff that God does through us because I'm regularly reminded that all of us are far from perfect and that God, but God uses imperfect people because of his grace. That's the name of our church outside. It says grace because we understand it's the grace of God. The scripture says it's not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And as we begin the new year, we stop and say, God, thank you for every life changed. Thank you for every person baptized. Thank you for every child that was encouraged, every every hurt that was healed, every blessing that you gave. Can you put your hands together one more time and just thank God for the good things that he has done? Awesome. Now, uh, today is a very unique day. You know, we've got this whole snow thing going on, and uh, uh, people are funny. How many know people are funny? Uh, Facebook is a way to keep track of people's emotions, and if you're watching the game last night, there were many <laughs> highs and lows and all around, but there were, there were in between the game and the, uh, and I didn't get to see the game. I'm going to watch it this afternoon because I was at a high school basketball game in Shelbyville, Indiana. Who's your style, if you know what I'm saying? And so, uh, uh, where was I going? Oh, anyway, um, where was I going? Yes, where was I going? Oh, yeah, Facebook. So you get kind of keep track of people's thoughts and stuff and between the snowstorm and the, and the game. And so I, here are three of my favorites, all right? First of all, I have, a, I have a niece who lives in Columbus, Indiana. She's five years old. And apparently they were at the grocery store. And she said, Mommy, is the zombie apocalypse coming? Because everybody's buying food and being mean. <laughs> All the video gamers are saying, I think it is. Uh, One of the local pastors in our community said, uh, basically, since all the bread and milk are gone from the grocery stores, I guess it's a good time for everybody to share their uh, milk sandwich recipes. My favorite one was the one I saw last night that said, if you've been asleep for the last 48 hours, let me sum up for you. God favors the Colts, Colts, and there's no bread in Indiana. Can I get a witness in the house of God? All right. All of you fans of other teams, you just have to take it up with Jesus. 2014 is going to be a great year for you. 2014 is going to be a great year for our church. I am excited about what God is going to do in us. In your bulletin this morning, there's a calendar of events that, that are coming up the year. I want to encourage you to take that with you and, and, and uh, make that plan. How about this? Plan your life around what God is doing in your spiritual family. Uh, there's some great things that are going to be happening uh, in May. We're going to be opening our new sanctuary, and uh, we're going to have an incredible opportunity to go higher. We've been talking about going higher for years now, right? We're going to do it here in just a few months. We're excited about that. We're going to be bringing back Honor Our Heroes, and uh, we've got some exciting things that are developing there as well. And uh, uh, our missions convention in just a few weeks will probably be the most unique missions convention you've ever been part of, Live Dead Arab World. We have an army of young adults who are coming who have all decided to go to the middle of the Arab world prepared to die to preach the gospel of Jesus. And 14 of them are going to spend a week with us. Yes, God is going to do some awesome things in us this year. So I want you to encourage you to be part of it. And, uh, and oh, by the way, we have a new website that's live and uh, very, very exciting stuff. Would you say a big thank you to David Jones, our media director, for making all of that happen? Thank you, David. It's been a long time coming, and he's done a great job there. First Samuel chapter 3, the question we're asking today is what is God saying about 2014? What is God saying to us as a church? What is God saying to you as an individual? In a few moments, we're going to give you an opportunity to write down what, what you sense God is saying to you. That's why you need those notes in your hand or, or grab a piece of pen and a paper and write some things down. But I want to start in 1 Samuel chapter 3. 
And we're going to start with verse 1. The Bible says, The boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. I want you to think about that for a second. Basically, the scripture is saying nobody was hearing from God. Nobody was hearing the voice of God. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he couldn't see and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was and while Samuel was lying down that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. And he said, I didn't call you. Lie down again. He basically said, boy, go back to sleep. Any parents ever had that conversation? So he went back and laid down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. He answered, I didn't call you, my son. Lie down again. Go back to bed. (laughs) Verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Aren't you glad for the, the tenacity of God trying to get our attention? A third time, and so he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. So therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the, the Lord came and stood and called at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant is listening. May our prayer today be, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. How many know God still speaks? The good news is we don't live in the time that Samuel lived where there was no widespread revelation. Nobody was hearing from God. God speaks clearly today. God's voice is clear to us. He speaks to us through his word, right? And just as God spoke to Samuel as a child, God speaks to us here today. You can hear the voice of God. And so when we ask the question, what is God saying? We can be confident today that God is speaking, that God will reveal his heart to us, that God will reveal his will to us if we will hear. How many know sometimes in the hustle and bustle of life, we stay so busy with jobs and school and classes, and we've got to keep our social networks updated. We're so busy, sometimes we can't hear the voice of God. And it's not that God is not speaking. Perhaps it's the fact that we're not listening. Now, I've got some really good news. You want to hear the good news? God knows everything that's going to happen in 2014. He's already there. In May, in July, in September, in October, God already knows what's going to happen in your life. God already knows what's going, to ha- what's going to come your way, what kind of curveballs you're going to be thrown, what kind of opportunities are going to be presented before you, and for you as an individual and for us as a church. So guess what? It would be very wise for us to say, like Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Because we want to be in position, we want to be in the position that God wants us to be in. We want to be in the place that God directs. How many know his plans for us is not to confuse us, not to lead us off the beaten path. His pl- plan is to, is to help us, to provide for us, Jeremiah says, a hope and a future. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. The scripture says, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And pastor, what does that mean? That means that the Holy Spirit is a person. And how many know the person of the Holy Spirit has a voice? And he speaks. So he speaks to us by his Holy Spirit. The Spirit is speaking. So as we develop a relationship with God, his Spirit speaks to us. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 3, my sheep hear my voice. So if you have a relationship with God, guess what? You should expect to hear the voice of God. You should expect to hear God directing you and leading you in the way that you should go. And I love James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. God says, listen, if you want to hear my voice, all you got to do is ask. If you want direction from me about your future, about your life, about your family, about your vocation, about your personal life, about your health, he says, ask me. I'll give it to you. I'm not going to hold anything back. So he wants to speak to us today. He wants to reveal his will to us today. He's not playing hide and seek with us. 
And here's some good news. Do you know what's going to happen if you hear his voice and, and, and you actually do what he says? I mean, no, that's the second part of the message, right? Well, it's not just about hearing God, but doing what he says. I love Exodus 23, verse 22. We have prayed through this on Tuesday morning so many times. It's probably my favorite scripture verse to pray through. He says, if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemy and an adversary to your adversaries. I love just saying that verse. I mean, I mean, to me, that's an incredible idea. God says, if you'll listen to my voice and do what I say, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to be an enemy to your enemies, and I'm going to be an adversary to your adversaries. I like that. I would love God to fight on my behalf. I would love God to fight my enemies instead of me trying to win over them. Somebody say amen. amen. So we need to hear God's voice. God wants us to hear his voice. All we have to do is ask and be like Samuel. Say, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. So let's ask the question first. What is God saying to our church? And then the second question we're going to ask, what is God saying to you individually? Let's first, what is God saying to us as a church? As I've prayed and as we sought the Lord concerning the new year, uh, two overarching principles that I think God is saying to us. There's a, there's a whole lot uh, every year we get together toward the end of the year, our pastors, we pray and we, and we get together and we say, what is God saying to us in, uh, as a group as far as themes and scriptures and, 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 and topics and things like that? Very excited. I'm very excited about what God's going to share with us this year. But there are two principles that I think God is, is saying to us as a church that we need to be thinking about as we enter the new year. And the number one is really, really deep. It's, I mean, it's so deep you've probably never heard it before. God is saying to us to pray. Pray. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I want you to look at that verse and see what it says. Everything by prayer. Everything by prayer. Pray about everything. Prayer is the key to everything. I'm going to say it again. Prayer is the key to everything. Pastor, what are you talking about? We need to pray. I know we need to pray. Well, let's talk about, I need to talk about my marriage. I need to talk about my family. I need to talk about the direction for the future. And I need to talk about healing and I need to talk about deliverance. I got some good news for you. We're going to talk about all those things as the year, as the year goes on. We're going to focus on those things. But can I tell you from the very beginning of the year, God is saying prayer is the key to all of those things. If we will pray as a church, if we will pray as individuals, God will affect every one of those areas of our life. Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about more than just a general call to prayer. I sense that God is calling us to a season of focused, directed, faith-filled prayer as individuals and, and as a church. Because if we will do this, if we will get the first things first... The scripture said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you as well. He's saying prayer is the key to everything else. Prayer is the key to everything else. So I've come to, to a conclusion as your pastor. I've come to a conclusion that the very best thing that I can do for you as a, as a follower of Jesus is to encourage you to pray and teach you to pray and admonish you to pray, and provoke you to pray, and then encourage you again to pray, and then teach you again to pray, so that we become people of prayer, and what Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers of all time. People would come by the thousands to come hear him preach, and here's what he said. He said, I would rather teach one man to pray than 10 men to preach. Wow. Talk about priorities. What a great importance he was saying for praying individually because it affects so much. We need to pray because it's the key to everything else. We need to pray because it's the key to spiritual maturity and growth. I said prayer is the key to growing up as a Christian. 
I've been saying this for years, and I'm going to keep on saying it, that spiritual maturity is still the number one need in the body of Christ. Spiritual maturity is still the number one need in the body of Christ. We've got way too much of this going on. And it seems, that, it seems like our relationships with God become more shallow and shallow and shallow. Can I tell you that if you will pray, you will grow. If you'll talk to God, he'll talk to you and he'll reveal his will to you. And God will do great things. You know, the vision of our church, it's listed on the back of your outline there, is that we are a disciple-making church. That we develop self-feeding Christians, self-feeding followers of Jesus. So we're not dependent on somebody else all the time for our spiritual nourishment, that we actually know how to fish, right? You give a man a fish, you fed him for a day. You teach a man a fish, you fed him for a lifetime. And so for us as, a, as believers in Jesus, we want you to come to the place where you're actually talking to Jesus yourselves. You actually have a relationship with God. Let me go ahead and say this. Prayer defines your relationship with God. If you have a relationship with God, it's because you pray. If you pray, you have a relationship with God. I think for many people who name themselves as Christians, we have a religion now in our head because I believe. It's not just about believing. It's about calling. It's about talking. So Jesus did not die on the cross so that we could agree with him. He died on the cross so we could have a relationship with our heavenly father. He was the bridge between death and life, between heaven and hell, so that we could talk to him. Show me a person who's praying, and I'll show you a person who's growing in their relationship with God. We need to pray because it's our only hope, and it's a great hope. We need to pray because it's the best preparation for the return of Jesus. And 2014 may be the year that Jesus Christ returns for his church. And if Jesus Christ returns in 2014, may we be found a people of prayer. We need to pray because we need God to do the impossible. Zechariah 4, 6 says, there, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. That happens when we pray. We need to pray because we need God's spirit to direct us to navigate the moral dilemmas of our culture. If you were with us last Sunday, in the second service, my apologies again to the first service, we had a guest with us, Ty Weiss, who was sharing his story about overcoming homosexuality. And what an amazing story it was, an amazing testimony. And, and for, for me at least, I know for many of you as well, I'm sitting there going, I've never heard anything like this before. Because it wasn't about politics and it wasn't about anything else, it was about our hearts. It was about our attitudes. And can I tell you that the only way we're going to be able to navigate the moral dilemmas of our culture, and there are many, is for us to stay close to Jesus, for us to keep our hearts close to God. Are you with me today? We need to pray because it's the key to your fill-in-the-blank problem. We need to pray because it's the key to your relationships problem. We need to pray because it's the key to our financial problems. We need to pray because it's the key to our emotional challenges. We need to pray because it's the key to our family issues. Or, or, fill in the blank. Whatever it is that you are challenged with in the new year, that's what we need to pray. Because guess what? Paul says, pray about everything. Everything by prayer will be affected. So the primary need for us is to pray. To learn how to pray, and then to actually pray. Are you with me today? Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. You may have heard this before. If you have, say it with me. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. If you reduce that verse and simplify it, there's a lot there. But I think we can easily say that that verse is saying, God says, if you will, I will. If you will, I will. If you need God to move in your life, he says, ask me. If you need a miracle in your nation, God's saying, I double dog dare you to pray. 
Are you, are you serving the God of the Bible? Have you read the stories I've read about Jericho and floating axe heads and sun standing still? He's the same God today. He's the same God today. So let me issue this challenge. Are you ready? Beginning next Sunday, we are going to begin a 40-day prayer challenge. Pastor, what's a 40-day prayer challenge? Get this. The challenge is to pray 40 days in a row. Isn't that awesome? Pray 40 days in a row. Now, for some of you thinking, Pastor, that is such, that is so easy because you already do it. God bless you. But there are a lot of folks who, who struggle with consistency or they don't know what to do, how to pray, or, or maybe they're just not making it a priority in their lives or, 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 or for whatever reason. So as a church, we're going to challenge everybody that from January 12th through the middle of February, that we're going to be a people who are focused intentionally to pray. Because one of the best ways to learn how to pray is to pray. We're going to model it for you. We're going to teach you how to do it. We're going to encourage you to do it. And our small groups are going to use a, a video curriculum that has been a blessing to a lot of folks called The Circle Maker by Pastor Mark Batterson. Uh, there's a 40-day devotional that we're going to make available to you next week called Draw the Circle and just 40 devotions about prayer. And, you know, and, and, and it's not about any of that except learning how to pray. And then toward the end of those 40 days, we're going to do a seven-day fast together as a church. Now, I know some of you are, are, are like, when's the fast? When's the fast? Because typically we do it in January. Well, this year we're going to do it toward the end of the 40-day challenge so, so that it will be something that we build toward and we're believing God to do some great things through us together. So I want you to begin to plan and prepare and think uh, about the 40-day prayer challenge. Take that small group enrollment form in your bulletin, or if you're watching online, you can sign up online. Just hit the small groups tab and say, count me in. I want to be part of this 40-day prayer challenge this year. Because if we will, God will. Here's the second thing I think God is saying to us as a church. Prepare for harvest. What I sense that God is saying to us is that we as a church, we need to prepare for the harvest. Let me know the preparation for the harvest begins long before that first fruit is ever taken in. You know, when a farmer goes out to the field in the fall with his combine or his tractor to harvest all of the grain or all of the fruit, can I tell you, that's not the first time he was in the field that year. He was in the field in the spring, getting the, getting the ground ready, breaking up the, the ground, plant up the ground, sowing the seed. He was in the field in the summer, watering, keeping the weeds away, protecting it, watching over it, and probably praying about it. He spends two-thirds of the year preparing for the harvest because the window of the harvest is really small. Are you getting this? Now, we're about four months, give or take a few Sundays, away from moving into a new sanctuary. And it's going to double our seating capacity. And some of you would say, well, Pastor, why did we build that? We built it for a harvest. We built it because we believe that God has uniquely positioned us as a place where people will come to know Jesus. Where people who are broken can find hope. Where people whose lives are falling apart can find confidence in Jesus Christ. Well, people who are bound up by stuff can find deliverance and healing through the power of Jesus Christ. We built it because there's a harvest that God wants us to reach. There's a harvest that God wants us to be part of. There's a harvest of people. God says, who's going to go for me? Who's going to speak for me? Who's going to speak the truth? And we say, God, use us. Use us. Why did we build the sanctuary? Because we want to make room for more people that need God, that need hope, that need healing, that need restoration. And it's not going to happen just because we open the doors to a building. It's not going to happen just because we have a new space. It's going to happen because we prepare for the harvest. Do you want to be part of a harvest? Do you want to be part of lives changed? We saw the, the, the numbers of people that have been dramatically ministered to, and just that one slide doesn't even begin to touch all of the stories and the people and the divine appointments that God used us together to be part of. 
But can I tell you that what we're about to see is all of those numbers to multiply if we'll prepare. So here's my second challenge. Some of you are thinking, boy, I'm glad I'm watching online today because a lot of challenges coming. I'm talking to you. Where's the camera? Whatever. There you are. I'm calling on every person hearing my voice today to move from being a spectator to being a participator. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I need your help. God has uniquely positioned us as a church to be a place of hope, a place of healing, a place of life. So I'm asking you, please, please, pretty please, find a place to serve. There are, in this congregation, people who used to pastor churches. There are people who were elders at strong churches and serving the Lord. There are people, you were, you were a Sunday school teacher. You taught classes. You taught this or that or the other. You used to do this. But now you're in a season of waiting. You're in a season of rest. I get all that. That's fine. But I'm telling you today, we need you. It's time to activate the gifts and the talents that God has given you because the harvest is coming and we need to be ready. Will you help us? You say, Pastor, I don't even know what to do. I've got some good news for you. We're going to help you. Beginning this Wednesday night and for the next six or eight Wednesday nights, our adult Bible study is going to be preparation for the harvest. I'm calling it church life. And what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about what it means to be part of a strong church, what leadership looks like, what strengths you might have, how you can be part of it, and what, what kind of needs that are there. And we're going to go through the scripture and talk about what a healthy church looks like and your part in it. So, you Pastor, I don't normally attend on Wednesday night. Guess what? New Year's resolution, at least the first six or eight. Join us beginning this Wednesday. Why? Because we need small group leaders. We need teachers. We need people to show hospitality. We need people to help care for people. We need leaders for new ministries that we don't even know we need yet. We need media people. We need people to work with kids. We need outreach people. We need preachers. We need teachers. We need you. What is God saying to you, Pastor? God's saying to me, provoke the people of God. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. So you know what I've been doing? I've been saying, God, raise up laborers because we need to prepare for the harvest if you're here today, you say, you know, Pastor, I'm just not really sure. You know, church is going to get bigger. There's going to be more new people. I'm not going to know everybody. Can I go ahead and confess something to you? I haven't known everybody for a while now. I'm just, you know, I try my best. I usually rely on Tracy. She knows everybody. She got us our first ministry job. Did you know that? We went to try out for this church in Terre Haute, Indiana, be a youth pastor of this great church. Got this cookout and this volleyball. You know, I'm just, I mean, I'm competitive. I'm, I jump in there, I start spiking the ball, knocking people down, you know. <laughs> At the end of the day, she had everybody's name memorized. They hired us. So I owe all of our ministry success to Tracy. She started us up. The reality is, it's not about us. Can I tell you, it's not about us. It's about the harvest. It's about the season that God has called us to. So as we move forward, the question that you should be asking is, God, how do you want me to be part of this harvest? How do you want to use me in reaching people? Because let me be very clear, I can't do it myself. 
we have far, far, far outgrown our ability for one or two or three or four or 10 or 12 people to make it happen. I need your help. Would you help me? So that's what I believe God is saying to our church. It's going to be an exciting year. I want you to be part of it. Please be part of it. Now, the second question I want to ask you here today is, what is God saying to you individually? What is God's voice speaking to you about your life, your future, your schedule, your job, your school, your relationships, your family? I'm I'm talking about something way different than a New Year's resolution. I'm talking about being like Samuel and hearing the voice of God and say, God, speak to me. And what you say, with your help, that's what I'll do. Now, if you have a bulletin, there's a place in your notes for you to take a few moments and write down some of the things that God is saying to you. If you don't have one of those nearby, Just take a piece of paper and a pen or pull out your phone. Don't tweet or Facebook. Pull out your notes and write down some things that God is saying. What's God saying about your relationship with God, your spiritual disciplines? Write that down. What's God saying to you about your relationship with others? Is there forgiveness that needs to take place? What's God saying to you? What's God saying to you about your time and your schedule? What's God saying to you about your family? What's God saying to you about your vocation, your job? And then there's a place there at the bottom where you just say, what, what else is God saying to me? Maybe it's not about those things at all. And I'm going to give you a few moments, and this is just going to be a time of reflection. This is the altar call here today for you to hear and write down what God is saying. I'm not going to ask you to share it. I'm not going to ask you to bring it to the front. This is between you and God. But sometimes we're so, so busy, we'll never take time to do this unless we make time here in church today. So that's what we're doing. So as Lane plays for a few moments, I don't want anybody to leave. I don't want anybody to please not be talking. I just want you to listen and hear the voice of God. And then as God speaks, write down what God is saying to you. And then we're going to believe that with God's help, he's going to make it possible because it's not by your might and it's not by your power. It's by his spirit, the Lord says. Father, we pray today that you would speak to us, that you would open our ears to hear what the spirit is saying to the church in these last days. Lord, as men and women, as young adults, as teenagers, and God, even as children, we pray that you would speak to us. God, we pray the prayer that Samuel prayed, speak for your servant is listening. Now take a few moments, if you would, and write down what God is saying.
take those notes or whatever you've written and keep them out today, maybe even the next few days. Write down what God is saying as he continues to speak to you. Maybe you want to share them with a family member or somebody. And it's amazing how confessing that gives it greater power for it to actually come to pass. And the, the biggest challenge today is to say, Lord, now I've heard your voice. Help me do what you say. Because I want you to become an enemy to my enemies and an adversary to my adversaries. Amen. I'd like to close the service today by praying for some special people here today. Bryson Davis has uh, been with home from the Marines for a few weeks, and he's going to be heading out this week uh, back to where he's going to be serving. So I'd like to pray for Bry Bryson, if you don't mind. Would you mind coming down here? Bryson is standing in the middle. And uh, as we pray for Bryson, let's pray for Austin Knotts, who also is serving in the Marines. Shane Rose, a uh, member of our church, is currently serving in Afghanistan. Uh, John Neely, many others that, uh, that we want to pray for here today, that God's power, God's spirit. Could I have our pastors and our elders to come? And I want you to surround Bryson and and any family member or friend that you know that's serving, let's pray that God would be with them, to strengthen them, to watch over them, and that the blessing of the Lord would be upon them. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for people of courage, for men and women who are following your direction and serving in the military. And God, in these amazing times, we pray that you would go with them that your hand would be upon them, 
for Shane, for Austin, and for Bryson. God, we ask your holy angels to guard over them and protect them. We ask God that the spiritual warfare that surrounds them will be one of victory for the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask for warring angels to be their guard and their protection. God, we pray that you would uniquely empower them and use them to be a voice of truth, an example of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. God, we pray that you would give them favor, favor with their fellow soldiers, favor with their officers, and God, use them uniquely for your kingdom's sake. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, and we place all of these in your hands because you do everything well, and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me today as we close here this morning? We are only having the one 930 service here today, so there will not be an 1115 service. Thank you so much for all of you that made it here today. I just want to encourage you to be very, very careful and slow as you go home uh, and be blessed. I want to pray a New Year's blessing on you before you leave today. Is that okay? May the Lord bless you in 2014. May it be a year of supernatural favor. May your family be blessed more than ever before. May the Spirit of God speak clearly to you about your direction and your future. May every one of your household members find Jesus in 2014. May the power of God rest upon you as you serve him. May he give you divine revelation that you've never known before. May his hand be upon you. May his angels protect you. May he provide for you in supernatural ways that everyone around you will testify, the Lord did that. The Lord made it happen. May the spirit of heaven come upon you as he did in Samuel's day. May you hear the voice of God and may you do all that he says. I bless you in 2014 by the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Happy New Year. Amen.